Hi, my name is Chaz Newby. I used to play bass with the Beatles for a short time, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that centers on what's going on news-wise in the lives of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show. You know me best for a program that I host, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, uh, we're going to tackle a subject that we did on our last show. And it's kind of interesting because so much has happened in the past week since we recorded our show on this very same topic. And it's getting kind of crazy out there. It has to do with the new release. It's a digital release on iTunes called The Beatles Bootleg Recordings 1963. And I thought to hopefully kind of make sense of this all, (laughs) this mess, (laughs) Some people might think of it as a mess. Uh, we, we'd bring back Alan Cozen, who is a writer for the New York Times, and he's also the author of the brand new ebook called Got That Something, which is all about the song I Want to Hold Your Hand from the Beatles, its importance, and everything leading up to the release of that song. We welcome Alan Cozen to the show. Hi, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hello, everybody. So let's just talk about this release, because uh, from everything that we had heard, the reason why this came out was to protect the Beatles from copyright laws in which they would have lost the rights to release recordings from 50 years ago. And, and in order to protect the rights to issue them at any point in the future, they had to release them now. That's my understanding of, they, of this. They would have had the right to release them at any time in the future, but if they had released them, they would have been released as public domain tracks, and anybody could have taken them a week after they released them and, and put out their own edition, and that's what they want to protect against, I think. And that has actually already happened with Love Me Do. There have been um, a couple of releases, mainly in Europe, of Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You on, on releases that aren't affiliated with the Beatles. And so, and I think and it looks like they're trying to put a stop to that, although they've been it's, it's been really quiet. I mean, what's really been strange about this whole thing is there was no press release other than um, a description on uh, iTunes that we were just discussing, uh, and there was no advance alert other than the fact that you know that I found out about it a week ago, and you found Alan, you found out about it, and. We both wrote about it in advance, and and the way it broke was just really strange. Uh, it's very yeah. unusual. The impression that I get is that the Beatles really, well, when I, when I say Beatles, I mean Paul, Ringo, Yoko, and Olivia, the four parties there. They don't really want this stuff out. They're doing it only so that you know they they hold on to the rights of these recordings and can make money off of them. Um, I think that's true. Um, I think they don't want it out, or they want to reserve the right to put them out in whatever manner they see fit in the future. But um, did you explain in your last show the way the European copyright law works? Somewhat. We haven't ta- we haven't <laughs> talked about that. That's kind of why we're uh, well. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We did we did talk about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah but go ahead and go ahead and explain it again. Simple. Yeah. Um, The thing is that until last November, the European copyright law basically said that for recordings, which are treated differently than literary works and and things like that, but for recordings, a work is under copyright for 50 years. Then they amended the law within the last couple of years. They've been working on it actually for a few years, and it was finally passed, I think, about a year ago, and it's supposed to go into effect sometime in 2014. They now changed the rule and said, okay, anything from after 1962, 62 is the cutoff. I mean, something like Love Me Do was released, but it was 50 years. It's now out of copyright protection. But anything from 63 forward, if it 
has been released, it now has 70 years of coverage from the time of release rather than 50. If it hasn't been released, the coverage is only 50 years from the time it was recorded. That's why we're seeing all of this stuff that was recorded in 1963 coming out before the change of the year, because those things will now fall into copyright protection. The interesting thing uh, about it is that because there's a distinction between the unreleased and released stuff, both of which are now going to get, well, will get 70 years of copyright protection once they're released, but the things that were released yesterday on iTunes will have 70 years from 2013. So, you know, your outtakes from the Please Please Me album are protected for 70 years. The released takes from the Please Please Me album are only protected for 70 years from 1963, so they're only copyrighted for another 20 years. Isn't that weird? The outtakes will have greater copyright protection than the finished version. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, now, one thing I don't understand here is that there's all these other recordings from 1963, other outtakes that the Beatles haven't released. So those wouldn't be protected then. Exactly. And that, in fact, is something that I don't think any of the three of us understand because it makes no sense whatsoever. There are, of course, the rest of the sessions from the With the Beatles album. There is uh, the I Want to Hold Your Hand in This Boy session. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are maybe another 40 BBC tracks that haven't been put out either on on air, live from the BBC, or this first batch of unreleased things. And, of course, there are, uh, at least from 63, a handful of live things that haven't been included on, say, the anthology or other things which get them into copyright protection. Uh, So there's actually, there's enough for, I don't know how many more discs worth, um, and they will be, as you say, unprotected because they're not published. The whole whole situation is just so strange. Uh, it's, It's the fact that they went about this, you know, very quickly and, Somebody must. There, somebody must have pushed the panic button over there, and uh, you know, I don't know. Well, they waited until the last minute, and that's a strange thing because, you know, a year ago we had the first of the Dylan sets that was put out specifically to address this issue. In fact, its subtitle was uh, the copyright extension mm-hmm. you know, edition. They were very frank about it. Uh, they, like Apple, <laughs> wouldn't talk on the record at the time, but. But off the record, they explained the whole situation, and they were very, you know, open. But um, so Apple has to have seen that. I mean, it, it, it was a very famous release. It got a lot of coverage. Mm-hmm. And they have lawyers, and they must have known that, you know, we're going to face this situation at the end of 2013. And, in fact, we're going to face this situation at the end of every single year. So why don't we put out a sensible package of unreleased stuff that will get the stuff into um, into circulation. And, you know, maybe they plan that from here on out, but this year it really just looks like a rush job. And, you know, with no press release, no announcement, no physical release, it's just all very strange. Well, there hasn't been a, a press release because I think that the Beatles, and when I say that I mean Apple, that they don't want this kind of thing to be something that's emphasized. It's not that's right. It's not their core catalog. It's not something that re- really they've gotten behind, you know, fully as something that right. they're proud of as an as a new release. They're doing this because they feel they have to. But at the same time, I was also wondering, you know, you listen to these recordings, and we all three have, and there are some sonic upgrades here. Which makes me wonder, you know, they must have cared somewhat about this. But at the same time, I'm also thinking because there's so much BBC material, I'm wondering if any of these tracks were actually considered for on air. And since they were trying to improve the sound of those tracks, maybe this is the leftover stuff that they were considering for that compilation. I don't know. Yeah, that was my feeling, too. It's a funny thing. Um, I have an editor at the Times who is very interested in the Beatles and Dylan and bootlegs and and all of this stuff. And I gave him a copy of the uh, material um, 
actually before before it came up in the U.S. when we thought that it may not come up in the U.S. And he, when he originally looked at the track list when I wrote about it last week, he said, you know, who's going to want this? There are five She Loves You. There's all these outtakes of there's a place and misery. And, I, I, you know, only someone like you would want this. And he took it home last night, and he came in this morning, and he said, you know, I started listening to it, and it was really great. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's a very eccentric release, but I have a feeling that when people listen to it, they'll say, you know, this is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's done well on the iTunes chart. Um, it probably could do better if they had given it a more a, a broader release. But, you know, as, as you say, Ken, it's, uh, I, I think they didn't want this out. They don't want attention drawn to it. They just feel that they have to do it for legal reasons. And I do hope that, um, you know, they think about it more carefully for 1964, 5, 6. Here's the big question, though. When they get up to 1969, and there are, what, a hundred some odd discs worth of Let It Be outtakes mm. floating out there in bootleg land, what are they going to do about that? Right. <laughs> and put all that stuff out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys well, you, even even now, I mean, there's discussion, there's talk that, I mean, there. I think it's more wishful thinking that there's going to be another release before the end of the year, which I honestly don't think is going to happen. But when you talk about 1964, you're looking at Hollywood Bowl. You're looking at you know some great some great stuff from '64. Well, uh, Hollywood Bowl should come out legitimately. Well, I, mean, I know, and I they, agree. Yeah. But assuming that they don't, um, assuming something like that doesn't happen this year or next year, keep in um, mind that about half of the Hollywood Bowl, or maybe a third of the Hollywood Bowl recordings, actually are already protected by exactly copyright because they were released in '77. Right, right. But the rest of mm. it is not. And so, right. you know, you got that, and then you have the the '65 Hollywood Bowl concert. And Shay, and Shay, yeah, you got Shay too. The problem's going to get really compounded from oh, yeah. year to year. Um, and then, Absolutely. and we haven't we haven't discussed about the the way things happened beginning, you know, on Monday, um, where you know it started showing up in Asia on actually on Monday before you know the day before it was supposed to come out here. And Alan, you we were talking about this before we started, and you were saying that, and somebody else mentioned this too, that they were it was actually over the dateline. It was actually all it was actually, it was actually Tuesday. Tuesday there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I had thought it was Monday too because when I got up at uh, well, I was about to go to work at eight o'clock New York time, mm -hmm. um, and I looked on a website that I frequent that um, has a lot of Australians and New Zealanders on it. And they were saying, it's here, it's 1599, this is what it is. And, uh, you know, they were uh, pretty ecstatic about it. And I went to work, spent all day Monday checking on iTunes in case it was going to be released a day early here. Uh, then, you know, went through the day, went to midnight and kept checking iTunes and, um, you know, got up a few times during the night and checked iTunes got up at 8 o'clock in the well, got up at 6, actually, and, and checked again and thought, okay, I better write a story about this because my, my Australian friends are now saying that it's gone. It vanished from iTunes in mm -hmm. Asia. And I thought, okay, something is up, and maybe we're not even going to get it, you know? That was the feeling I heard on, on, on Facebook Monday yeah. night. People got really frustrated and really nervous That's and, right. uh, that they weren't going to see it. So I wrote a story about it, and I filed it before I left. Um, got a call from my editor at about 8.25 and said, well, you say that it was released Monday, but you know, what I, I, everything that I'm hearing is saying Tuesday. And I said, no, really, before I left the house at 8 o'clock on Monday, it was out in Australia. And he said, yes, but the time difference... You know, we're used to time differences like between San Francisco and New York and New York and London. You know, you don't mm. think of like it being a whole day ahead. Mm -hmm. and, but so my editor said, okay, right now it is 2.35 a.m. on uh, Wednesday in New Zealand. And it was like 8.35 in New York on Tuesday. And he said, so 
how do you feel about it now? What is it? What do you What do you want to say? And I said, well, okay, in that case, I guess when I was reading about this at 8 o'clock in the morning New York time on Monday, it was really Tuesday in Australia and New Zealand. So I guess it wasn't really. We, we all thought of it as being released a day early. In fact, the way I wrote my piece was that it was a little bit like a solar eclipse. If you were on the wrong side of the world or weren't paying attention, you'd have missed it. Mm-hmm. You know, supposedly it came out when it, when it was supposed to, and I, and whatever happened on Monday, as strange as it was, I guess you know I don't know. Um, but you know mm-hmm. the, the the other story I'm hearing is that it happened on time, and you know it, because it was originally planned for Tuesday, and that's what it was supposed to do, and. Except you know. that, you know, when I got up on Tuesday, mm-hmm. the messages from my friends in Australia were, it's gone. They what? had taken it down. So, I mean, that's the other reason. It, it's not all that we were just anticipating too much and freaked out. Stuff was going on that that was up on iTunes in Asia for eight hours and then vanished for another day. Mm-hmm. And, know, like, and, and, and uh, I was looking for it. Um, at midnight Eastern time, nine o'clock California time, and it wasn't there. And I ended up, I ended up going to bed that night, saying, you know, well, I'll wait, I'll see what happens in the morning, because it was not, it was not there when I, when I went to bed that night. Why don't you just bring your iPad to bed with you, and you can check it every few hours? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My general feeling about this whole thing is that the Beatles themselves didn't want this out, so all they had to do was release it, even if it's only out there for a few hours. And then they'd be covered. Mm-hmm. So then they pulled it off the market. But then you were telling me, Steve, that here in the United States, they released it on iTunes and they pulled it off again. Right. So what really struck me about this whole thing is that, and today, and we're recording this on December the 18th, you posted an article on Beatles Examiner that this is now the number one uh, compilation or album on iTunes. It's the number one. In fact, I was just looking at the looking at the updated charts while we were sitting here talking. It's still the number one rock album. It's the number six album overall. It was number four last night. Yeah, but it's I number also, six overall. I think the reason why it's that high is not just because it's the Beatles. It's because of this frenzy that was created, and I think that was right. done intentionally because people are panicking. How are we going to get this? And mm-hmm. if it's, it's suddenly off iTunes, you know, the thought is you better grab it while it's on there. So you got a lot more people who are going to buy it initially instead of waiting a while. Right, right, awesome. exactly. How do so you feel about that? Dollars instead of fifteen ninety nine Australian. Except it's not fifteen ninety nine in Australia anymore. It's not 60. anymore. No, when it's, it came back, it was seventy. I think. I think it's yeah, it's like seventy dollars in Australia now. So that's yeah, that's pretty strange too that that there's such a big price difference and then there was a. You were talking about your friends in Australia. There was a, a newspaper article, the Herald Sun, complaining about the price, about the price right. difference. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that could have been why it was taken down after eight hours. You know, there might have been some miscommunication or glitch about what it was supposed to be priced at. Mm-hmm. Um, although you wouldn't think it would have taken them as long to fix that as it apparently did. I mean, it was off for uh, for most of what was Tuesday for us. Right. So. Um, <laughs> You would also yeah. have thought that that would have been settled on ahead of time rather than waiting until the last minute like that. But the whole thing has been crazy. I mean, I mean, it's a very odd release. There's no promotion, no ads. So far, no ads. Um, and you can't get Apple or Universal to answer any questions. Yeah. Right. Exactly, yeah, because, uh, yeah, I've been running into the same thing that you have. The only thing that we know is that Despite what people were fearing initially that it was going to disappear, that apparently the indications are that it's not going to disappear, that it will be available. But for yeah, how the, long, the, we don't know. The hmm. phrase that was used was the foreseeable future, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, who knows who can foresee what. But, <laughs> yeah, right. so it'll be there apparently for a while. It also is, by the way, I mean, partly because of... Uh, the way it was handled, I think, it, it very quickly began to be traded around in bootleg circles. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, especially, it's, yeah. Especially during that time when it was down in Australia, you know, and it, it didn't look like it was going to be coming up here. People just began sending it around to their friends. I mean, which is, 
you know, uh, in, in, in a way, a shame from Apple and Universal's point of view. I mean, if this had been done in a more organized way, there probably would have been less of that. Mm-hmm. Right. So, right. Well, you know, there's also that thought that this kind of thing caters to, as much as I hate to use the, the terminology, a hardcore fan. You take a look at something like On Air, which debuted at number seven here in America on Billboard, and then it just completely tanked. You know, what makes you think that something like this, if it was packaged and promoted, would do any better than that, or even probably it would do less than that? I well, think the boo lake the boo lake thing has something to has has an attraction for for people, even if they aren't really well, they they aren't really boo lakes now. But I mean, just to the the term boo lake has kind of a you know have, has kind of an attraction for for buyers. Um, it's like putting putting it in a headline in the story that you know you're automatically your eyes automatically attracted to that and i think that has a little bit to do with it the thing is that uh, i think it would have had an appeal if they didn't put it out like this in other words and and accept that in you know what i'm going to say wouldn't have been practical because they had to have it out before the end of 2013 but what really would have made sense would have been if in, say, February to celebrate the recording, the 50th anniversary of the recording of the Please Please Me album, they had put out a package that had that album in mono and stereo with the outtakes that they've just given us and maybe, you know, fill, filled out with uh, some more of them, uh, maybe the relevant BBC performances, maybe some live recordings, you know, and, and it, this is what you would actually have expected from Apple now that Jeff Jones is there, because when he was at Legacy, that was precisely the kind of thing he did. Mm-hmm. Well, if they hadn't put the, the mono box out, I would say they probably they might do that, but I can't. I, that doesn't seem likely to me. Do you honestly think something is going to happen come February? I don't. I really don't. I think mm-hmm. they're not organized enough for something like that to happen. But that's what should happen, really. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know, I mean, and this idea has been around for a long time. I mean, I was once talking to Bruce Spicer about, uh, I guess it was sometime before the 2009 remasters came out. And when there was talk of, you know, the fact that they were going to come out, he was saying, you know, what they really should do is, is put them out on Blu-ray, with all the outtakes and modern mm-hmm. and stereo and that kind of thing. And, you know, all that kind of info could fit on one Blu-ray disc. Um, but, of course, they didn't have that either. And they still haven't They still haven't done that. I, I keep hearing rumblings to that effect, but obviously nothing has, has happened yeah. yet. Let me switch the, the discussion a little bit because you just kind of mentioned things coming out in February. We've, you know, we've got the, the capital box that's coming out now. And that's a very that's kind of strange, too. Yeah. Um, Why is that strange? Fact, I mean, it's perfect timing. It is perfect timing. Well, the fact number one that it was kind of announced again in an offhanded way with the because the the albums popped up on uh, Amazon in England and Japan, um, right. hmm. and that was that's a little strange. And then and then we had the website that kind of announced it but didn't announce it. And now, and then we had the box set, you know, announcement. And what's really weird is the mixes. And yeah. um, Alan, you were saying that the the information that they gave out and go ahead and explain it came from the came from a booklet in the in the in the set. Is that where that came from? Uh, yeah, there is uh, all the information that that you had printed in, mm-hmm. uh, on on your second article about it about uh, the technical side of what's going to be done is actually a page of the booklet that comes with it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, someone someone with a very quick eye and a and a very good you know uh, stilling program. Um, watched, I think, the video, they flipped through the book and actually managed to isolate the page and <laughs> reproduce the page. And it, and it was precisely that same material. Yeah, what they're going to do is for all of the tracks that were, from a certain point of view, in, in, including, I have to admit, mine, messed around by, with by Dave Dexter, uh, mm-hmm. you know, had reverb slathered onto them or were mono tracks made into fake stereo mm-hmm. through a process that involved 
boosting the bass on one side and the treble on the other and then putting a couple of microseconds delay between the two tracks to fool the ear into thinking it was hearing something different. Or the alternative, which is when they only had the stereo tracks but were putting out a mono album, they just uh, did a, a, a fold down to mono. Right. So in those cases, you know, those aren't ideal and the tracks with echo uh, and reverb all over them aren't, I suppose, ideal, but the thing is they are what it was. Right. Now, Capital, uh, or Universal, but this actually, the press release had a Capital logo, so I guess we can say Capital. Right. Um, it's put together a really beautiful box set. I mean, the the covers, the, the fact that they come with the reproduction inner sleeves, the fact that Yesterday and Today has the trunk cover, which you can peel off and reveal the butcher cover. <laughs> it's beautifully done. But the sound is not going to be the sound of the American albums. And there is a total of one reason that you would want to listen to the American albums, and that is to hear what people heard at that time in America. And with the new set, you won't hear that. Well, that's you know, a shame. And I'm going to... Well, what they what they are going to do is there are uh, you know ten or a dozen um, mixes that are specific to the American albums. Like, I mean, the uh, most obvious one is probably uh, I'm looking through you in mono with the false starts. Right. But there are some other times when um, Capital was sent mixes a little earlier than uh, Parlophone was going to release things in England. And new mixes were done in between the time it was sent to Capital and the time Parlophone put it out. So the Capital mixes are unique. Apparently, they're keeping those. But in that case, you know, and the rest are going to be replaced with the 2009 remasters, either in actual mono or stereo without the reverb. Um, I think we neglected to mention that point. So in that case, what they could do is put out this set with the covers, um, or a nice booklet showing the covers front and back and the inner sleeves and the butcher cover and put out a single disc with the 10 or so orphaned U.S. mixes and let you make your own compilation using the British 2009 mm -hmm. mixes. It's, there's, there's really no need for a 13-disc set. Well, they haven't really said what they're going to do with the old with the old Capitol album sets either. Um, um, they kind of have, but off the record. Uh, they are out of print now, and they are never coming back. That's which is really a shame, because yeah. they were, I mean, you were saying the only reason to, to listen to them is to is what Capital did with them. But for those of us that grew up with these albums, I mean, I it was years before I heard with the Beatles. I knew my first exposure to the Beatles was Meet the Beatles. And right. it was, you know, I didn't hear with the Beatles, even though... I lived on the East Coast at the time, and and you know some of the radio stations were playing some of that stuff. You know, I didn't, I never heard with the Beatles for you know uh, for it was years after. And I, as a matter of fact, my first pe uh, Pepper album was the mono, and I didn't hear the stereo one for years. So you're not alone true, there, but, Steve. But you see, if you just get a a, the U.S. sequence of Meet the Beatles, but using the British mixes, you're still not hearing Meet the Beatles. You're no, exactly. No, I know right. that. I, I understand that. That's my point. Right, and that's and if that experience is not part of the new box set, that's going to be very. That's going to be tragic. Uh, it's going to it be. It is. The only really reason the only reason I would even buy this box set is to hear the songs as I remember hearing them with those mixes. I mean, the packaging exactly. is nice. You know, I care about the packaging, but it's the music that matters the most to me. And i got to mm -hmm. be honest with you, you know, I grew up on the American albums just like you guys did. But when the CDs came out in 1987, I got used to the way it was released in England, and I really haven't listened all that much to the American albums. Meet the Beatles has never left my head. But if I was going to listen to them now, I'd want to hear them with those mixes. And there are times, even still to this day, when I miss the reverb of I Feel Fine and She's a Woman. You know, and even yeah. even I want to hold your hand mean. sounds very dry. You know, if you listen to I want to hold your hand the way it was released there, it's just it's dry compared you know, I, to. I have to say, I mean, long before the 1987 CDs came out, 
um, I had been listening really just to the British albums. I mean, once I realized that those were the ones that, that they made and they sequenced and they mixed, um, I just put the U.S. albums aside and never listened to them again until the first two box sets came out in 2004, 2006. And when I put them on... I mean, I thought that I thought it was really kind of charming, you know. I loved listening to Meet the Beatles with that reverb and in that sequence. And I always really have felt that that Rubber Soul, the American Rubber Soul, is a really good album. Mm -hmm. I mean, starting an album with I've Just Seen a Face instead of burying that song on side two of Help is it just seems so natural to me. Mm -hmm. It's because we're used to it that way. Well, no, it was a, it was a better lineup, really. I mean, that was one of the few instances where Capitol beat out Parlophone, you know, as far as what they did with those albums. I, I mean, the Beatles complained about it, but, you know, that's one of the times that, that they did something right. Well, I think there's an argument to be made there. You know, it's just kind of like when you're comparing with the Beatles and, and meet the Beatles, and some people would rather hear I Want to Hold Your Hand first, and some would rather hear It Won't Be Long first. And it, a lot of it is all just, you know, what you're used to and how you were brought up. But, you know, meet the Beatles has... Um Apart from it has, it has Tilda with you, was you, which is a cover, and it is the only cover on that album. Meet the Beatles is a, a really a completely Lennon, McCartney, and in one case Harrison album. It, it showcases the Beatles as composers better than either with the Beatles or Please Please Me. Mm -hmm. That's very true. That's one instance where there's such a drastic difference in that regard. But in their first four British albums, three of the four had six covers <laughs> on there, and that's right. what they were doing at the time. And I think they did great covers. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I, I, I do too, and, and I wonder if Capitol took them off because they thought, who wants to hear British guys selling American music back to Americans? Right. I do wonder about they that. They may not have yeah. even thought of that. You know, but. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm hoping that there's a better explanation than what we've already had on that uh uh, for those mixes, I'm 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 crossing my fingers. Let's put it that way. And then when you look at this, all these albums, is there really a need for the Beatles story to come out on well, CD? There probably isn't a need for it, but um, I'm kind of glad to see it back. I don't think I'll listen to it again more than once, but hmm. maybe even less than once. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it was a it was a relic of of the times. Yeah. And it also, by the way, it does have the little clip from the Hollywood Bowl in there. That, That's uh, true. So that gets know, that but, back into copyright. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, true. But um, may I, you know, this actually may have something to do with that. The, you know, we didn't. Uh, that hasn't even been approached. But maybe this, maybe having the albums out does have a little bit of something to do with, the, with that whole copyright thing too. By the way, it should be mentioned that the copyright thing only has to do with Europe, in, in right. America. It's a totally different situation. Yes, in America, copyright protection lasts for three thousand years. <laughs> You're, oh, no, sorry, it's actually just, it's that, actually that was just Disney's original version of the bill. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, it, it's now like like the life of the uh, for 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 compositions is the life of the composer plus ninety five years or something. I thought it was only ninety five years. Is it is it ninety five plus? Is, is that right? There is there is something like that. Yeah, life plus. Okay. Um, but, you know, I mean, when it, when the Constitution, uh, copyright actually goes back to the Constitution itself. And, and when it was first envisioned, um, the term was 15 years. Right. So right. you can see how far we've come. <laughs> well, and see how far the, the music industry has, has uh, lobbied to, to yeah. get things, you know, their way on this thing. You know, it's, it's, I mean, that's really what's happened. Um, I, I mean, I'm not saying that it should be 15 years, but... but and the yeah. film industry and, and, and others. You know, pro probably more the film industry and the music industry has been sort of swept along in it, and, and you know, without complaint, obviously. Right, right. But really, so, isn't, isn't it irrelevant at this point where the copyright laws are from because of the Internet? Because anything could leak out over the Internet. I mean, if something comes uh, out that... True. If something goes out of copyright in Europe, then someone could legitimately make an album in Europe and, uh, you know, 
even if they import it here in the country of origin, it's completely legal. So the company itself can't be gone after, only perhaps the importer. Right. Hmm. And also... A family uh, full of lawyers, I think, this way. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some recordings that came out in America that were different than the way they came out, uh, you know, in the U.K., like, you know, I'll Cry Instead, the longer version. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be able to get that released on CD. Yes, that's true. That's true. Well, all, all ten or so of those songs. But you know what? In a way, they missed out on another two because they didn't include Magical Mystery Tour in the 13-box set, uh, 13 disc set. Mm -hmm. um, and Magical Mystery Tour has unique American mixes of both I Am the Walrus and uh, the stereo mix of Strawberry Fields. Right, and I forgot about those. I forgot about those, and somebody reminded me about that the other day. So, yeah, I mean, it never ends. <laughs> It, it does never end, you know. And really what they ought to do is they should consult with us before they put something out. They really should. They definitely, <laughs> most definitely should. We'll, we'll have to talk to them about that. It's pretty obvious the Beatles, Paul and Ringo, don't even think about these things. <laughs> no. Well, Paul is claiming these days, and I, you know, I don't actually believe him, but he claims that he can't um, remember which came first, rubber soul or revolver. Oh, no. So, <laughs> So, yeah, well, they don't really think about those kind of details. Well, that's pretty amazing. Uh, well, I always remember in the Beatles anthology when George Harrison said that uh, he thought Rubber, Soul, and Revolver were the same album. Yeah, he you know, thought stylistically, they were like you know. bookends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think of Revolver and Pepper as being closer. Do you really? Yeah. See, I've always thought of Rubber Soul and Revolver as the bookends and, and, pe and, the, and the gulf goes from Revolver to Pepper, but... That's me. Really, because because R Rubber Soul is very acoustic, mm -hmm. not totally, but but to a great degree, and Revolver is very electric and, and you know backwards tapes and avant garde and and uh, a lot more Indian influence uh, apart from just the, the little sitar melody in Norwegian Wood. It's now got actual Indian music. You go to Pepper, you've got more Indian music, more electronic. And backward stuff. So yeah, those two to me seem so, seem similar in a way. Yeah, and and you're right. It, it they seem to they do seem to to go together. It's I don't know why. I don't know. I think uh, m musically, musically and stylistically, I would agree. It's just production wise that was Sergeant Pepper was so much more layered. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Revolver is a much leaner album production wise. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, let me ask Alan. Do you think I? I we kind of covered it already, but do you think there's more coming in the near future? Um, well, I've heard, as, as you have, these rumors about uh, further volumes before the end of the year. Um, I asked specifically um, some sources close to this if that was true, and I didn't get a yes or a no. <laughs> the mm -hmm. question was simply ignored. Well, um, I, 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 I mean, I saw the, the rumor um, on the Hoffman Forum. And um, mm -hmm. so that's why I don't put a whole lot of faith in, in it at all. Um, but, you know, you never know. You never know what's yeah. going to happen the, these days. I mean, if, if, like I said, two weeks ago, if you'd have told me this, or three weeks ago, if you'd have told me this was going to happen this week, I'd have, I'd have said, I'd have laughed. So, mm -hmm. who knows? Well, but keep in mind, they do have the rest of that stuff that needs to have copyright protection. That, yeah, and... see, there's the, that's the hang. That's the hang-up right there is that they do have that dilemma in the works. And I don't know. We'll find out soon enough. Well, the question Christmas, is. It's supposed to be Christmas Eve, according to, which is a terrible day. I don't know why they would have picked that day. The question for me is, are they going to release everything that's in the vaults every single well, year? What and they then, seem to have done in the first batch is ignore anything that was a breakdown. So only complete takes, and that eliminates a certain amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I don't think in any case it will be everything, everything in the way a bootlegger would do it. Right. Um, so uh, I, I, I really have no idea. I mean, we, we pretty much, we pretty much know what there is left over that they ought to release if they want it protected by copyright. Right. And um, 
whether they will, I, I guess uh, we have a few weeks to see. Well, about two weeks, really. Two weeks, yeah. We don't have very, we don't have that long, yeah. so we'll we'll find out sooner or later. It really sooner. would be nice if they did what Alan suggested, and let's just say for 1964, they put together a box set of some kind for a hard day's night. Mm-hmm. Did a stereo and a mono, and then you know all that it takes and everything like that, and do the same thing with Beatles for Sale. The the interesting thing but, though that is if they did do the second release on Christmas Eve, how much would it be, and would people want to pay? Especially if it's another thirty nine ninety nine or whatever, will people want to pay that? And that could get the reaction could get interesting then, because you're already asking people to buy that box set next year, and and I heard people and I saw people on Facebook grumbling Monday that they were going to cancel their their capital box set pre-orders when the when the uh, bootleg thing didn't come out. So, I don't know. We'll be interested well, to see. here's the thing, you know, I, I think they don't care whether we buy these um, so-called you know, bootleg recording projects or not, and that's why they can charge whatever they want. If, if we're willing to pay for it, that's great, gravy for them. And if we're not willing to pay for it, well, they've succeeded in having it published and therefore, the stuff is under copyright protection. Right. So I, I don't think it matters to them either way. And I mean, I I, I can say that you know I'm going to get them. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter what they're. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I mean, I I'm, you know I feel like you do, even though you know we probably all have. I mean, so much of the stuff has been out there before. But yeah, you're right. So. So the question. I mean, besides, I mean, I've written. I, I wrote an article. Um, some years ago, basically arguing that bootleggers are culture heroes, and um, because they're preserving material that might otherwise be destroyed, and you know, or, or otherwise has been lost. And one of the th- points that I made in that article is that anybody who collects this stuff seriously to want all these bootlegs would definitely buy it if it was legitimately released. So having written that and published it in the New York Times, I, I feel sort of honor bound to actually buy anything. <laughs> There you go. But, but my question to you, Alan, would be, all this time, I think that whenever there's a Beatle release of any kind, there's a lot of thought put behind it, usually, when it's a commercial release. And they want it to do well. They don't want anything that they release to be a flop. So should they really care about product that basically caters to the hardcore fan? And I know that, Steve, this is now in, in the you know number one rock album mm-hmm. on iTunes, but... Will it have any staying power? You know that really is what determines whether or not there's that much of a, of a demand. You're basically catering to a hardcore fan who is going to buy everything instantly or relatively soon after the release, and then that's it. Should should the Beatles just say, well, "I don't really care, just let it go out there. It doesn't really matter," or should they care about you know the the quality of the recordings that go out there? I don't mean production wise. I mean the material. Should everything just be the best product? they could possibly release or should every you know or most outtakes be released an unreleased material even if it's below par that's something well, that's been a question really for many years if they want to protect the copyrights well then that's you know that's the only reason why this is being done as far as i can see i mean why do you think it's just 1963 right well i'm just saying this in general there are fans yeah. out oh, in there in general <laughs> they should be doing a much better more thoughtful Job, I absolutely agree with you. But in, in this case, you see, I think I think we now have two tiers of Beatles releases, starting with this. One is the stuff that they want to put out and that they want to be, you know, very beautifully produced and, you know, generally admired by record buyers. And then there is this stuff, which... You know, I'm sure they're happy if it's number one on iTunes, but they're only putting it out for a totally practical reason. They don't really want to, as as you said earlier, and uh, it's it's completely utilitarian. Mm -hmm. You know, they say they'll be there for the foreseeable future, but I kind of don't believe that. I mean, look at what, what Dylan did with his version of this. He put out a set last year and a set this year in a limited edition of 100 copies. Basically, everybody who wants them can get them from bootleg sites, and it's not a problem. And I asked someone at Sony last year if, if they cared about that, and they really didn't. You know, 
they actually kind of seem to agree with my theory that people who are into this as collectors will buy the official ones when they come out. So for now, they're you know they have copies of the of the bootlegs. That's fine. Especially uh, if there's a reason to, which apparently, which there is. I mean, there is a there is a, a Sonic upgrade on on several of the tracks. So yeah, um, definitely. That's a that's enough of an excuse for people to buy it. Okay. Well, I'm just saying my argument here has been, and I've discussed this with Steve, that the Beatles themselves or Apple have never really cared about the hardcore fan. That's true. Mm-hmm. You know, they really That's don't true. care I mean, about they, the... they feel that the hardcore fans are just some sort of fringe element, and uh, I don't understand it, you know. I mean, I, I really feel that the uh, BBC sets <clears throat> should have been a 12-disc set, with everything available, sequenced chronologically, with good notes, such as Kevin Howlett has already written but published separately as a book. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that would have solved the, bo- the, the copyright problem for them. For you those, know, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about, when we, when we were talking about the on-air, uh, I suggested that it would be great to have those. Because not, cause not only would it have solved the copyright problem, but the shows sound better sequenced fully sequenced. Yeah. When you've heard right. them as whole shows, they sound a lot better and they're a lot more enjoyable than listening to little song excerpts, little songs, you know. And they say hardcore fans, but, you know, look in the jazz world. You can find a huge box set of everything by Django Reinhardt. And, mm-hmm. you know, you can find humongous box sets of Miles Davis concerts that originally had been edited down to maybe a single LP, but here's the whole week's worth of concerts that were actually recorded. I have to think, much as I love Miles Davis and Django Reinhardt, I kind of have to think that there is a larger audience for unreleased Beatles stuff. I I don't know. Mm -hmm. It it just seems they were somewhat bigger commercially. Um, well, I, so I, I don't understand why they look at the hardcore fans as a fringe group, but Ken's right, they do. A, a, another example is uh, Hank Williams. Um, all those radio, the health and happiness shows that he did. Right. Um, you know, you can buy, I, I don't know how many, I forget how many discs they are, but you can buy all of those and, uh, you know, pay triple figures for the, for all of that stuff. And it's Well, and Elvis. There's the Elvis mm-hmm. Presley Follow That Dream series up to now, I believe, volume 129, most of them at least um, two disc sets, with outtakes from it, just about every single session and movie session, you name it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's an awful lot of material. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. got to be some demand, but it's all a question of, in the case of the Beatles, I think they've always cared about how well their albums do. Does it make the top ten? Does it make number one? I don't. I don't think they want to embarrass themselves by putting out they've something that little, that becomes a flop in their they've minds. They've always been a little conservative, though. At least they were when it came to putting things out. Because um, Elvis, Elvis never had any any problem, or the 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 Elvis uh, uh, estate never had any problem with putting out single outtakes to uh, to a, a release of stuff that had already been released and saying here there's a you know there's a single track we've never put this out before and the Beatles have started to do that but uh you know um on occasion but now they're now you know they've kind of gone to the other extreme with this thing with the blue like release you know so you know I was thinking Alan when you were on our show last that you were talking about George Harrison and that he was you know, one of the main reasons why Carnival of Light didn't come out and that he he didn't believe in anything that was, in his mind, overindulgent right. to be released. He probably would be dead set against this coming out. Probably. Probably, but uh, I wonder what he would feel about the copyright argument. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. True. Remember that he was the one that argued against the, against the, the Star Club stuff. Right. So... Which, by the way, is now in public domain. Which, by the way, is now in public domain. Right. <laughs> right. And, in fact, I was looking at a release this morning that has some of that stuff on it. So, yep. Yeah. Bingo. <laughs> All right. Well, we that uh, kind of uh, puts a wrap on this show. Alan, thanks so much for joining us. Again, your new Thank book. You. Your new book is called Got That Something. It's an e-book all about uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is a delightful read. 
Yes, right. please buy Alan's book. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, of course, you're welcome to come on any time. My pleasure. Th- yeah. Thank you again, Alan. You came I should tell everybody, he came on on somewhat short notice, and, and uh, but thank you for doing it. We appreci- we appreciate it. Well, let's hope fun. Let's hope that by the time this show gets posted that there isn't anything, anything a new development oh, with God. this release. Please. <laughs> You know, that's one thing. Those developments are fun. Yeah, <laughs> developments are fun, except when they happen between the time this, we tape and the, the time the show airs. But, yeah, they if you, are. If you listen to our show before this one, it sounds so dated now. <laughs> you know, things yes, can, it does. Things can change on a dime when it comes to you know, news on the Beatles. So I know. That's right. And But we love it. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So thanks again, Alan. And for things we said today... I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying, go look at iTunes, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>